Matt Bendix. I work at Wien University in Sweden. I'm also associated with the IMC University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And then I run and organize a network of people interested in software configuration management. Uh, I'm a professor. I'm from academia. This is going to be a purely theoretical presentation of abstract hot air. <laughs> no technical details at all. I'm going to talk about continuous delivery or continuous deployment. And when you're at this abstract level, then, well, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, we call it code, C-O-D-E. So when I'm talking about code, then you can put in whatever you want to put in. So I'm going to talk about continuous delivery today. Uh, whoops, this is not continuous delivery. Well, I'll be back in Italy in two weeks, in Parma, where we have the Italian SCM Summit. It's a very informal gathering, very few people, 10 to 15 people. We're going to meet there. We're going to meet again in autumn. This is the fourth time that we meet on April 15. Uh, you're welcome. It's free. Uh, we have very good discussions. And our main focus is software configuration management. And there's a URL there that I won't give you time to write down or take a photo of. So who am I? I have a master's degree in computer science, not software engineering. Um, I've learned myself something about software engineering later on from Monash University in Denmark in 86. I got a PhD in configuration management from Aalborg University in Denmark in 96. Uh, I've had research visits in PISA sort of between the period of 86 and 92. Then I moved to Germany for a year. And in 97, I came back to Bologna for a six month for research visits. Uh, I've been working with configuration management, software configuration management since 86. And uh, since the late 90s, I've been into Agile. So around, I can't remember, 98, 99, some of my students at Old University came to me and said, Oh, nice. Have you heard about this new exciting thing? <laughs> it's called Agile. It's called extreme programming. It means that we can do whatever we want to do. <laughs> we don't have to follow any rules anymore. I said, well, I can't believe that it's like that. Yeah, yeah, it is. So I had to learn something about Agile. And I was right. You can't do whatever you want. Um, but it was interesting. And I picked it up. In 2001, I was headhunted by Lund University. Uh, I started there. I've been doing research and teaching. So you can see I've been teaching some configuration management in Parma since 2005. A very short course, one week. Gives me the possibility to come back to Italy at least once a year. Sometimes my wife joins me. Um, and since 2014, I was teaching a configuration management course at the IT University in Copenhagen. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are three dedicated, complete courses on configuration management in the world at university level. I do the one in Lund and I do the one in Copenhagen. <laughs> uh, the third one, they wanted some material from me. That's given in Rio in Brazil. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't need my help, only my material. So. <laughs> So that's the level of what we produce at university, unfortunately. We experience some of our students to add joint development. I'll talk about that later. But let's look at the continuous delivery dream. So you have a story or a feature, and boom, it gets delivered and into operations. That's wonderful. Now, let me show how my students think that it works. <laughs> like this. <laughs> so we have a continuous delivery fairy, and she sprinkles some magic dust, and then this story and feature goes into the delivery. And everyone is happy. It doesn't actually work like that. And our students, they experience that and discover that. So we have a setup with agile projects for the students on the second year. 
uh, 8 to 14 students, they are in the same room at the same time. So, we remember we are in Sweden, we can force students to do that. Uh, so they come in Monday morning at 8.15, sharp, and uh, they program in a computer room until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And when I was a customer, I went down to the computer lab at 5 o'clock and I kicked them out. Because I said, you have to go home now, because otherwise you're not ready for the next sprint. They have two coaches, each team has two coaches, that is older students that followed the project a couple of years before and that are giving a, co a course in coaching. And then the practice part of that course is to do some free coaching on these student projects. They have one customer, his time shared. Uh, we don't have resources for dedicating a teacher or a PhD student to every group, so every customer services three groups. And we suffer the consequences of not having a customer on site. Well, they do six <coughs> weekly iterations. Uh, the semester is divided into two reading periods of seven weeks, so we can't do more, more than six uh, iterations. And usually it's sufficient for the students to learn what they're supposed to learn, to do just about all the mistakes that they can do. And then things start to run fairly smoothly, and then there's no use to run more iterations because we are at the university and, and students are supposed to learn, not to produce. And when they learn very little and produce a lot, then we just stop it, on to the next course. They do a two hour planning game, four hours of individual work, spike work. It could be looking into how AND works, how we can use Git in a better way, or analyze some of the stories to see what is the impact, what are the things that need to change when we implement this story. And then this eight hours of coding on Monday morning from 8.15 or until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, one hour for a lunch break. They're supposed to do a release to the customer every other week. Usually, well, almost always, they mess up miserably the first, so they have to do one more the week after. So they end up doing four releases in six sprints. We're using all the XP practices. So pair programming, continuous integration, collective code ownership, test driven development, frequent releases, whatever. And uh, the coaches, they are there to remind the students that they should actually do test driven development. Right, the test first. It's called test first, not test after. The empirical basis for this is that uh, we have been doing this since 2001. Uh, we didn't do continuous delivery right from the beginning because it wasn't called continuous delivery then. It was called frequent releases and that was what we did in the beginning. Uh, I've been working as a coach for these students for some years, so I got very close contact with the students to see what were the difficulties, and uh, I also worked for some years as a customer, maybe not yet, always appreciated by the students, because I was sort of giving them challenges. Like if they were using Java 6, then I put my Mac back to Java 5, meaning that the first release that they sent to me didn't work. So I could tell them, well, the first thing you send to a customer it's not release one, it's test one. A test that you are able to send something to the customer and make it run on his computer. Lesson number one. <laughs> These coaches are doing an in-depth study. Uh, since I took over the coaching course, I have managed to interest some of these coaching students of, in experimenting with something like continuous delivery with these students to see whether they can actually cope with it. Uh, and I have supervised three master theses uh, in companies also on uh, continuous delivery and aspects of continuous delivery. Now, why do continuous delivery? Why are we doing this? Well, my students, they don't have a clue. Usually they do it because the coaches are doing an in-depth study on it. 
Well, the first is like five million flies can't be, be wrong. I mean, you know how it is with Git, at least among students. Oh, Git is so good. Git is fabulous. Git is wonderful. It, it can save the world. I mean, why is it so good? Everyone says it's good. <laughs> so, frequent releases. We want faster time to market. We don't want the competitor to be on the market before us. We want to attract good developers. Good developers want to work in good environments using good processes and good tools. So, continuous delivery is that. Nice. We don't want to be left out. We want to have feedback, we want to have closure, and we want to have a higher focus on policy. Well, let's look at some of these. Probably when I show these things to you, you will laugh, you will shake your head, and you will say, only students can be so stupid. Um, unfortunately, at other venues, I've seen people doing like this. Oh yeah, that's how they work in our place. So apparently also some of these mistakes are done in the industry. Now one of the things that we want to obtain with continuous delivery is feedback. So here we have a programming team, a little old fashioned, but it's a programming team. Here we have a customer loaded with money and uh, we want to give some feedback to the customer. So we would want to say this is why you should pay our salary. And if we want to have our salary once a year, we send something to the customer once a year. If we want to have a salary every month, we should send something to the customer every month, or maybe every two weeks or whatever. And the customer also sends some feedback back to the team. It says, maybe this was what I said, but it was not what I meant. Any one of you is married? <laughs> no, I don't have to say more. <clears throat> you know how it works. So we also want to have feedback with time to market. Ask the customer, the clients and users, do you like this? If we do it once a year, they will say, yeah, we like this, but now it's so last year. We wanted it six months ago, 12 months ago. So, and sometimes it tells you that the lean credo is that we want to deliver so fast that the customer doesn't have time to change his mind. <laughs> so, whoops, here it is, do you like it? Well, I would want it to do a little bit more like this, okay? Any complaints? Write a new story. And then you get the story into the background, you prioritize this and we get into the loop. Instead of the customer coming after two or three months saying, well, some of the things that you're working on now, I don't want anymore. That's like the waterfall approach. It doesn't work. So try to develop your, your requirements together with the customers. The pluralists here and the market. So don't think that a product owner knows what the market and the people needs. I mean, Steve Jobs is famous for saying, well, people didn't know that they had a desperate need for the iPod. So if I had asked the market what they wanted, they would never have come up with the iPod. We did. And then we asked them, and they said, oh yeah, that's cool. I don't know why, but apparently my students, my coaches, they have fallen in love with Kanban. I don't. So I, I think that Kanban should be banned. Well, maybe not for you because you're mature and you're able to handle this, but my students, they can't handle it. So what they do is that, well, there's a customer, he comes up with a story, then it's on the Kanban board, then there are a number of columns that it has to go through, and then it ends up into done, and uh, then it goes out to the customer, and the customer is happy. Now, they also, at a certain point, realized code review is a good thing. And code review is actually a good thing. Um, 
it finds a lot of problems. So they introduce code review. And uh, they think that what they're doing now is that we have a process here, and there's a feature, a store, it goes into this pipeline of, of steps on the Kanban board, and there's already something here, and there's a story there, and it's almost delivered to the customer, and uh, everything is nice and wonderful, in theory. In practice, what happens is something like this. <laughs> And I won't tell you which box is the code review box where the story ends and now someone has to pick it up, the next available pair, and do code review because you don't pick the story for code review. You go down here and pick a new story that you can bring from it. It's much more fun. And then they queue up before code review. Or maybe we don't have time to do the code review. The Linux project, that's one person doing the code review, Linus Torvalds. He ended up being a bottleneck. That's why they implemented the systems with his lieutenants. So now there are many more people that can do a pre-code review before final code review ends up with Linus Torvalds. So we have to remove some of these bottlenecks. Uh, and if you can't use the carrot, then we have to use the whip, saying, well, if there is something that needs code review, you are not allowed to pick up a new story. You have to do the code review. And when these things have queued up for code review, now it's time to do a customer release. And then we have to hurry these to do code review, or maybe we don't have to tie it time to do the code review and well, it becomes really messy. Another type of feedback that we want to have. So let's go back in time. I'm an old man uh, and my hearing is not so good. So if you have any questions, then you have to speak up. Otherwise, I can't hear you. Uh, back in the 60s, we came with a bunch of punch cards and gave them to a person and then that person would take them and go into a room. And basically, what we were asking this person is, that will this work? And something like two weeks later, he would come back and say, no, that was a mistake on this punch card. In the early 80s, when I went to university, I, I still saw people using punch cards. I've never used them myself. There it was that, Here's my code, I gave it to the compiler. Did I get the syntax and semantics right? And in about two minutes, it would come back and say, no, there's a problem here, there, and there. I needed feedback. I, there was one of my fellow students that programmed for half a day the complete program that he had to do, and then he sent it off to the compiler and the compiler <coughs> told him there's a semicolon missing here, and he cried. I was different. I didn't, I, I knew that I was not perfect. So I had to ask the compiler every five, 10, 15 minutes, am I still on the right track? Are there too many semantic and, and syntactic faults? Here in the tens, what we're doing is we say, here's my feature, here's my story. Am I done? And hopefully, in a matter of seconds, the system, the continuous delivery system that you have in place, will come back and say, yep, they're done. It passes all the tests, and well, maybe it gets deployed somewhere, maybe it gets delivered to a customer, or maybe it's just delivered in a place where, when it suits the customer, he can pick it up, the latest version. So this is the type of feedback that we can give today, not the one that they got when they had the punch cards. Then something that I try to teach my students is that a pre-push question that you ask to the system is that, am I done? You don't want to push anything to the centralized, blessed Linus Torvalds repository. Well, by the way, you can't push anything to the installer's repository. 
But you don't want to push anything to the Bliss Repository unless you're absolutely certain that you're done. So you ask the question, am I done? And if it comes back and say, yeah, you're done, then you can do the push. You also do some post pull on questioning. You say, does it still work? Now I got your feature, I got your feature together with my code when I did the pull. Do things still work? I asked the continuous delivery system. And it says, yeah, okay. Then I can continue. I don't need to fix anything. And, well, you should actually also do a pre-pull question. You should ask yourself, or you should ask the system, am I in a stable situation? Do I have, do I have green on all my unit tests? Because otherwise, you really don't know what caused the problem. If it was you, some of your uncompleted code, or it was his new feature. So these are some of the things. So in reality, what we are creating with this continuous delivery system is the Oracle of Delphi. Or may maybe that's not what we want, because you can see the, there's, there's a guy down here onto the floor smoking funny tobacco, which this priest breathes, and uh, she gives some very weird and strange answer that you have to interpret. And instead, what we would like to have is sort of like a genie, that you ask specific questions, and you get very specific answers. And if you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. But I mean, we can deal with that. I keep coming back to Kanban. The Kanban curse, at least for my students, <laughs> is that at a certain point, we have to integrate the code in the code base. And uh, usually, they do that before the story is actually done. So what happens is that we again have this picture of things going through this pipeline, and uh, at a certain point it gets delivered. Now, what actually happens in reality is that sometimes it doesn't pass, and it gets thrown back and says, no, 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 you're not done. There's this problem. Fix this thing and, and, and sort of stuff. And it becomes pretty messy, and uh, sort of things end up here, and uh, then students try to fix this, and they come up with, well, we have a done state on the Kanban board, and uh, then, well, that's where it, it ends up the first time, and then it can progress to the done-done, and then it can progress to the really done, and then it uh, progresses to the should be done, and then finally to what the hell. It's just, <laughs> um, what these students are desperately seeking is that they are looking for closure. At a certain point, when this story bounces back for the fourth or fifth time, they get so fed up with it that they really end up in what the hell is just put it in, and then if the customer is not happy about it, then you can write a new story or whatever. Closure, we need to have closure. We need to say, this story is done. Let's move on to a new thing. And forget about that, that we already did. So what they do is that we have this pipeline with a number of steps. And uh, then my feature A pops up here, your feature B, and your feature C, and now sort of I have to go through this pipeline, and uh, you're waiting for your turn to go to, through the pipeline. And uh, at a certain point, I get bounced back because there was something that didn't work. And uh, well, maybe I get through to the next step, and it bounces back, and uh, sort of it's it's like a mess. Usually, well, it, it depends when when they don't do it as continuous delivery, when they think that well, we have to do three releases. Who wants to study and and all these things about how to automate releases and stuff when we only have to do three releases? Well, it means that they do this manually. 
which means that usually it's half an hour, an hour, two hours, something like that to do it. And usually they make mistakes along the way because we are humans, we make mistakes. Tools, they don't make mistakes. Or, well, if we, in our description, what they should do, describe a mistake, then they will repeatedly do this mistake. But once we get the continuous delivery pipeline right, it will work all the time. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't make mistakes because it didn't have a coffee, something like that. So what we would like to have is a situation where it's like, boom, 40 milliseconds, and uh, if it doesn't go through, it gets bounced, and I have to wait here, and then it's your turn. And then you can go through, and you get through, and then it's your turn, and you also go through, and then sooner or later it's my turn. And especially in the context of my students, this is very important, because we are at university, students are there to learn. Some of you have children? Me too. I mean, imagine if your son or daughter put her hand or his hand on the hot oven, and like three days later, the hand would hurt. Do you think that she would learn from that? No. But if 40 milliseconds after you put your hand on the burning oven, your hand hurts, you can sort of make the connection. So, at least in a teaching context, this type of feedback, this type of closure is very good and very important. Now, let's return to the stuff about five million flies can't be wrong. Well, this is the situation where five million flies can't be wrong. When shit hits the fan, then it sort of spreads. And I can tell my students a hundred times that you should never commit or push something that doesn't work to the centralized repository because when, if there's red in the repository, it will create problems for everyone and they don't remember. When I show them this picture, they will remember for the remaining life. So we don't want to have that situation. What they do is also continuous integration. Continuous integration is part of the extreme programming framework. So you do a temporary branch or a real branch, you do your implementation and you integrate your implementation. And uh, doing this, it gives me the possibility to say the four words that all children hate to hear from their parents. I give them a, a two-hour introduction lecture on configuration management for agile projects. <coughs> and I tell them what they should do. But I mean, students are like children. They never listen to the parents. So I get the possibility to say, I told you so. It's like they get merge conflicts, sometimes huge merge conflicts. And I said, well, I said that if you update two big chunks, you will get a merge conflict. So you should update often. And then they update often and say, I got a huge merge conflict. Because this guy spent the whole weekend refactoring the basic data structure and putting right all the things here and there that needed. And then when I came in on Monday morning, I took in a big chunk. I did all the updating, but he committed a big chunk. So he didn't allow me to take in little pieces. So we should commit often. If you have a big refactoring, I told you that a big refactoring should be divided up into smaller steps. And that you should allow people to integrate after each of these steps. Because then we don't have problems. Then we can have the logical words conflicts. There you should use the concept of strict wrong transactions. So maybe the part of the code that you have modified for a feature and the part of the code that I have modified for a feature touches different places. So many version control tools will not see that there might be a logical conflict between them. Git will. Git will not allow me to commit, to push, if I'm not up to date. 
So that's one of the good things that Git has. We can do something to try to make sure that changes are independent with having a good architecture. Well, my students, they don't do that. Then the quality focus and debugging. So we have a change, a feature, a bug fix, another thing that's committed to the repository. And uh, then the other situation is over there. There's a smarter team, they have a feature, they commit that to the repository, and now we run a test on the repository. Pooh, that's a mistake. Now I'm gonna debug this repository. Who wants to debug this repository? It's a mess, because it's five different changes and you can't quite figure out what changed. So we got a huge problem. And already in 1986, Wayne Babbage says that an ounce of different, 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 different derivation, doing a diff is worth an ounce of <coughs> analysis. So that over there, it worked in the previous version. It doesn't work in this version. What's the difference? Most probably, the problem is there. But if we have a huge difference, then we have a lot of lines of code to look at. Now what we're looking for is this type of quality, bulletproof. When we have a bulletproof quality, it allows us to shift to a whole new approach to problems. We can roll forward. Because if we have very good quality, it means that it sort of works most of the time. But there's a small problem here. We should really fix it. So let's roll forward. Instead of the traditional old one, well, this is completely fucked up. So let's roll back. Or this feature that you put on is problematic. Well, what happens if he added the feature, he added the feature, and he added the feature? It means that on the main line, your feature is no longer the latest. If it is the latest, it's easy to back out. But if it's not the latest, then my students haven't got a clue of how they undo that. If you use Git, then it's slightly easier. Continuous integration again. So really what we do is that we do a feature, we ask a question, are we ready to integrate? Yes, and then we integrate. Another one, no, we're not ready. Do some more fixes, yes, we're ready, and we can integrate. This is so easy, this is so simple, this is so beautiful, and it is so wrong. Because this gives my students the impression that we sort of merge things into the mainline. You never ever merge things into mainline. So what we do is that here, we should say, we should integrate what is on the mainline here, and then this is the latest and greatest, and we can sort of copy that down if we get the permission. I'm almost done. So this was my students' continuous delivery dream, sprinkle, sprinkle, magic dust. And uh, then we get to the done, done, really done, and we get closure and everything, and everyone is happy. So what did you learn today? Well, you remember I'm a university professor, <laughs> and you're my students, so what did you learn today? Well, continuous delivery is very much like fail-fast development. We are looking for feedback, and magic touch number one is that it is all about feedback. Giving feedback to the customer, you have to pay our salary. Giving feedback to the developer, no, the code doesn't compile, there's a problem with the logic, you're still missing two unit tests and whatever. We should avoid the bottlenecks, plan for scalability. So when Linux Tools becomes the bottleneck in the Linux development, then we have to solve that bottleneck. Uh, if we have continuous delivery pipeline that takes like two hours and uh, we have a mean time between 
pushes to the central logic repository of less than two hours, then we have a problem. Then the feedback time is too long. And well, I know that here in Italy, you have a long lunch. So maybe if you have a feedback time of two hours, you ask the continuous delivery system a question before you go to lunch. And then we come back from lunch, you get the answer. But in Scandinavia, we don't have two hour lunch breaks. So we need faster systems. Avoid idle time, automate, 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 automate everything. Uh, one of our master students, uh, for his thesis, he was looking into a company where the world says, no, 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 the, we are developing apps. A lot of the things is a graphical user interface. It's a graphical thing. We can't automate that. And uh, he believed the developers. And I said, I don't believe them. I said, try to look into all these sort of graphical tests and try to see how big a percentage of what they claim are graphical tests are actually a functional test. So I mean, if I want a ticket from Bologna to Parma, two adults on Alta Velocita, I sort of press some things on the graphical user interface. That is a graphical test. But the back end that sends the data and make sure that I get the correct ticket back. That is a purely functional test. And he estimated that uh, up towards 60% of what they claim were graphical tests that couldn't be automated were actually functional things that could be automated. When in trouble, roll forward and do it fast. But you can only do that if you have a very good quality. So, I guess that my students will never be able to grow forward. And uh, fail fast development looks an awful lot like test driven development. So, test driven development is that you have some questions. You should do this, you should do this, you should do this. You run all unit tests. It didn't do that, it didn't do that. Well, then you need to write some more code. And <coughs> continuous delivery is the same. Am I done? No, it was this problem and this problem. Okay, I'll fix it. Am I done now? Yeah. And then we discover that the tester missed a couple of tests, so I wasn't really done. But anyway. And never, ever compromise on quality. <coughs> Test and quality assurance are not your enemies. They are your best friends. <laughs>